Welcome to Girl in the Gov, the podcast. Where our goal is to make politics more accessible and less intimidating. The show features an interview with an expert in the political field, walking us through the many cues we have about politics, civics, government, and more. By providing civic education in the places we are. On our phones. And in the language we speak. And yes, we know, we say like a lot. It's kind of the point. Because <laughs> politics needed a rebrand. Welcome back to Girl on the Go the podcast. There are 13 days till election day, and you shouldn't let your friends miss elections. I don't know. That's just my thought on the matter. Yeah, you know, I similarly agree. It's Mm -hmm. funny how it's just two minds, minds over matter, just really come together on... Well, these two minds also put it on some merch that people can purchase. And mm. our friends at Social Goods created these incredible merch items and have them available at socialgoods.com. And what do you know? You know? Isn't that crazy? crazy? And you can literally go get some and it should arrive just in time for election day to remind not only your friends, but hopefully everyone you walk by on the street that friends don't let friends miss elections and imagine the ripple effect of what that can do. Um, not only are you reminding your friends, but the random strangers that see what you wear are going to be like, oh, my God, I need to remind my friends. You basically get to be an influencer without having to be an influencer. I think it's most important items of clothing perhaps ever created. Wow. That's yeah. That's a statement. Yeah. Well, That's, it's bold. Imagine. It's out there. Imagine if everyone it's... who laid eyes on these pieces reminded their friends that there's an election. Imagine the power behind that. You really think about it. Well, you know, it takes me three to four hours to process information, so I'll get back to you. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, that's obviously a reminder to go yeah, check out our collection with social goods. It's linked in this episode description, so go check it out. But Samantha and I are in New York City together, and you just, you know what that means. We're just going to be running these streets, <laughs> acting crazy. Not the rats. The rats yeah. do not run these streets. <laughs> I can't believe that. Can Wait, one of my that? friends literally, first let me say this comment and then we'll give the background. One of my friends literally texted me the original clip from like CBS and it was like on TikTok and she was like, is this real? Like, are you? Is this? This is really politics. And I was like, welcome to local politics. One. Two, welcome to the most entertaining bit of politics ever. And three, uh-huh. yes, this is, yeah. Okay, so for background. Give it. Mm-hmm. So New York City long has had a rat issue. I've had many a furry, not so friendly fella run over my feet. I have named them all Dimitri at one point. I mean, you really get up close and personal (laughs) with no reason. Like this is what drunk me does on a walk home. I go, oh, well, sup rat. And then I'm like, well, it's got to have a name. And I'm like, you're Dimitri. And then I look at another one and then I'm like, why does that guy look like Dimitri too? So anyways, for some reason, all rats in New York City look like Dimitri's to me. I'm so sorry for any actual Dimitri out there. It is not an affront to you, and I'm not saying you're a rat. But there's just something that felt right about this name. Anyways, names aside, these rats have obviously a problem. They came out with some sort of plan to tackle this. I have to look a little bit more in depth in terms of what they're playing. But anyways, they held a press conference. And the clips from this press conference are iconic. Gold. Oh, such gold. They are literally, it's like out of Parks and Rec. I swear to God, you mm-hmm. would never know that it wasn't. They make this whole statement of like, the rats don't run this city. We do. The rats aren't going to like this announcement. And then some guy goes, I, I, re- I genuinely don't know who this guy is, but obviously someone within the office, I have to check. But regardless, he's like, this isn't Ratatouille. And it's like just so, we'll, Which also, we'll link this clip. We will. Also, because- as a, if I were a constituent, like, I'd be like, excuse me, do not shit on Ratatouille. Like, don't you dare. So rude. That man's insane. Also, I really need to rewatch Ratatouille. I haven't seen it in so long. Fantastic. Fantastic. Like, no, absolute gold. And yeah, it's just so interesting. Like, I have so many thoughts. I'm like, first of all, there's a lot of, a lot of pressing issues at hand. And I, I mean, at least as a constituent for me, I'd be like, I moved to New York City fully knowing I'm going to see a rat at least once a day. 
you know so it's like almost like it's just once yeah exactly at least (laughs) and i don't know it's just interesting to me i'd be like this is what you guys are doing at this current moment but i'm sure it is something that you know as a resident you're over dealing with so it's just it's just funny but it's also just funny the communications directive behind this press conference and behind their language and it's like why are you acting like you know you're fighting crime or something it's like just change the 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 tone maybe well i think like with the communications of it it was interesting because i've seen some backlash being like there's so much crime going on there's especially on the subways the subways are so dangerous and Mm -hmm. we're tackling the rat issue which i think here's the thing like you can tackle more than one issue at once one issue doesn't mean that and a press conference or a piece of policy being passed doesn't mean another issue isn't being tackled i am in no way yeah. defending eric adams i am not a fan if you've been listening to this podcast for time memorial you know i'm not a fan regardless of that it's just one of those things i think that pe- gets a little lost in the sauce and that's local and national politics just because one thing is happening doesn't mean that another thing's not being addressed but i mm-hmm. think the tone of the press conference and the way that they were taking it on kind of like you're saying as if this is like fighting massive crime it's came off a approach. little like tone deaf to people that are like yeah. i have to ride the subway every day to work and i'm scared for my life right so you yeah. know i either way i do think the audio is funny it's viral on tiktok and like used yeah. for a lot of other things now it's like it said, it's they should have made it more gold. like playful and fun almost, I feel like, and be like, let's let's address this. But like the way that it yeah was this like harsh well, tone, it's like obviously incredible <laughs> sound bites and a TikTok sound that will be used for sure. Has been used. Absolutely. Well, I also just as far as any big news, I guess that's happened since we last talked to our, our listeners last week is that Trump officially mm-hmm. got subpoenaed and the video conference or him arriving at the Capitol will begin either on or around November 14th. So just mark your calendars because mm. and get your tea kettles firing because this will be interesting. But I yeah, agree. that officially we happened. That. We also had a pause on the student loan yes. debt forgiveness. It was like a green level. light. It was a pause and then a green light and then a pause yeah. again. Which and like I literally think is kind we of said, expected. I like I'm not surprised but look that's not a give up hope scenario by any means it's just interesting update of like it was also because it was such a shocking green light like coming straight from Amy Coney Barrett quite the ping pong moment and we'll be keeping everyone updated on that for sure but I think if you can receive student debt relief definitely still check out their website that they launched last week there is probably more now but it was eight million people had already applied so if again this is something that applies to you then go apply and hopefully by it will still everything will work out and you can get that relief but that's going to be probably a running story here classic we'll keep you updated Uh, as we say we we have not said that actually in kind of a while i think it's because the uh, Inflation Reduction Act passed, and mm. it was like the Build Back Better of it all. That was really the Pushing real that phrase. It was the real catalyst to "We'll keep you updated." Being that was a marathon. Truly, like truly. Lord have mercy. Like I look, I've never been interested in running a marathon ever, ever. not once. But not that once. really felt like I accomplished. Like I did it anyways. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. No, we we did do that. So. <laughs> I'm ready you for my Iron we Man. Could, could. Um, nonetheless, <laughs> should what? we Are get you... into this episode? Wait, you forgot something. Oh, oh yes. Yes. Guys, we have right. the well, I, I say this as if I was there. I just received the text message on the other yeah. side of this. But Maddie mm-hmm. had like the best run in this weekend. Yes. I saw our friend Amari at a bar in San Francisco. And Mari is amazing. But Amari is a political connection that we made a while ago. Again, we can't remember dates, so don't hold us to it. But she does such amazing work, like across the board. She, you know, helps out with League of Women Voters, represent US. And she also has a, a podcast called Platinum Rule. And for all the California voters out there, um, 
it's all California politics centric for the most part. And she actually told me too that they have an episode or episodes about all the propositions on the ballot in California, which is huge because that is the number one question I get from all of my friends when they go to vote is like, can you help me with these propositions? Like, I don't understand. So if you ha are a California voter and you've been like, I'm overwhelmed by all of these propositions per usual, go listen to the Platinum Rule and they break them down for you and also give you resources for getting to know your ballot a little bit. So just a plug there and another just friends don't let friends miss elections moment because just seeing, you know, your fellow political girlies out there at the bar. We took a picture, so we'll maybe post that on Instagram at some point just for Classic. everyone's enjoyment. But yeah, it was a very key run and it was not planned and joyous. I just still can't believe like I literally like wake up because also like West Coast, East Coast time. And I have this like middle of the night text from Maddie. I'm like, what <laughs> happens? I'm like, what? What could this be? And she's mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I ran into Amari. And I was like, that is the cutest, most wholesome text I think I've ever woken up to. So no, it was so cute. Love it. Big hug. Oh, you guys. Cute pics. Oh, and wow. yeah, it was lovely. I've been waiting to meet her. But nonetheless, now we can definitely get into our episode, especially speaking of California politics. Oh my God, have, so true. Whoa. We have a California big wig politician, congressman, Eric Swalwell. Oh, we really are on this California grind. Okay, well, mm -hmm. anyway, it's very exciting conversation. We won't waste too much time before we get into it, although I guess maybe we already did. So anyways, thanks for sticking with us. We're getting into the midterm elections, what's at stake, what Eric, what Congressman Swallow is really doing to get people amped. And that includes a really powerful ad that he put out last week regarding abortion rights in the U.S. We will, of course, link to that particular ad in the description, but it's a must watch, must share, super, super powerful. So we will be getting into it. That's exactly actually what we did. So without further ado, here's Congressman Swallow. We are honored to have you on, and you are the congressman for California's 15th district. Now, for people that don't know what district this is, like where on earth is this? Can you give a little bit of like background, just some geographic lessons, you know? Sure, sure. A San Francisco Bay Area, you know, right in the heart of the Bay. You know, it's Duck Up Nation. Go Warriors. Go Warriors. I grew up in the district. Go Warriors. Yeah. You've got Steph, Coach Kerr. Great team, a lot of championship rings. But no, I grew up in the district. I would say the most notable person to come out of my district would be Castro Valley High School graduate, Rachel Maddow. So she yeah. grew so up she, in Castro Valley? She grew up in Castro Valley. Oh, yeah. oh my God, I didn't know that. My and roommate grew up in Castro Valley. So yeah, yeah. She, oh, well. If your roommate went to Castro Valley High School, she would be, you know, an alum yeah. with Rachel Maddow. Interesting. So I tell people, okay. you know, I've got the smartest constituents in the world just don't hold it against them that they elected me you know, to be <laughs> their, their congressman. But they, you know, it is high expectations. This is the place that produced Rachel Maddow. It's wine country. We've got about 80 wineries in the district. We've got a lot of physicists who work at uh, two national laboratories that are in the district. And then frankly, it's one of the most diverse districts in the country. Largest Afghan American, the largest Pakistani American, largest Indian American population diaspora coming from, you know, those countries is in our district. We have little Kabul, uh, the book, the kite runner, if you've ever read the book kite runner yeah. uh, or seen the movie, it tells a story of a family that left Kabul, Afghanistan and came to Fremont, California. And mm -hmm. so that I, I think is our strength, frankly, is that we have so many people who came from such far places and brought resilience and you know just a survival mode and it turned them into entrepreneurs and innovators and that's why we have so many startup success stories mm, love it love it i am also bay area native so yeah which part shout out i grew up in the south bay in los gatos and i live yeah. in san francisco now so yeah. yes just go warriors over and over oh. <laughs> and the, a big we beat the kings last night i yeah i was a, in i was in dc so it's very hard to watch the Warriors when you're in DC because the games start at like seven Pacific. Yeah, um, but I'm committed, so I'll, I'll go till one a.m. Especially when we can pull out a, a win against the Kings. Love it. Good for oh you, honestly. Wait, I, also <laughs> major props because we did see you just got back from Ukraine, and I did have also a question: like, do you sleep one? 
two, <laughs> what are your recommendations for long flights? Because you have to have at least one from some of this travel. Yeah. Bourbon. Bourbon's good. Mm, yeah. Classic. Yeah. Look, I, I have tried to use like a number of different sleep aids. Ambien risky, right? Because like yeah. you don't want to be banging on the cockpit door saying, I'm ready to fly the plane. <laughs> like, you know, mm, it's you like, wanna, like wake up in, in TSA <laughs> custody. So I actually, I've just never been able to sleep. I'm an awful sleeper. Never been able to sleep. So I, I found this new drug called Day Vigo. So D-A-Y-V-I-G-O. It doesn't have the like hallucinogenic, you know, chemicals of Ambien, but it does allow you to sleep. You still need at least probably like six plus hours. Otherwise you'll, you'll still be groggy, but it knocks you out and you wake up, I think more refreshed than Ambien. But yeah. on, that, on that Ukraine trip, it was even after getting over to Poland, it yeah. was a 10 hour train ride to Kiev. So that was a long wow. midnight, a midnight train to Kiev. Yeah. 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 I cannot so sleep on you planes. Now you have a solution. Well, we're going to, we're going to try it out. We're yeah. going to, I will let you, you know how it goes. Problems. Yes. <laughs> let me know. It's one of those things. Love, but love the tips. Bourbon. Yeah. And bourbon. <laughs> Don't forget. Well, moving forward to what really inspired you to run for office originally and get into politics? Like, what's the story there? You know, I, I was back East on a soccer scholarship and no one in my family had gone to college. I love soccer. My three younger brothers and I were all, I think, decent. They were much better. But I saw pretty quickly from friends who were older that that was a path to go to college. And so I picked a school based on like three, you know, indicators that I wouldn't recommend for anyone, which was I needed it to be paid for because my parents had three younger brothers that they also needed to support. I wanted to play Division One because I think I was just competitive being in the household with, you know, four boys. And I was so impatient that I wanted to play as a freshman. I didn't want to sit for a couple of years. And so I mm -hmm. found a school like in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina called Campbell University. It fit the bill of all three. And after my second year, I was injured after playing two seasons. And I thought the world was over. And a high school teacher told me, you know what? World's not over. Go to Washington, D.C. for the summer. Be an intern for your hometown member of Congress. I, I didn't even know what party I was. Like, my parents... <laughs> were Republicans. And so I knew that meant I probably had to be like Democrats because I was just like a constant, you know, shit disturbing contrarian <laughs> at that age. And so I went in and tried to rehab the injury for my member of Congress, Ellen Tauscher. And I loved it. And I remember as I was about to go back to Campbell University in North Carolina, one of the staffers told me, she said, Eric, you, know, you love being here. You don't seem too enthused to go back you know, to Campbell, you're like a fish out of water there coming from the Bay Area. Why don't you just transfer to the University of Maryland and keep the internship? So I transferred to Maryland. I had to make the call to my parents that we were giving up a, you know, nearly a full scholarship at Campbell to be an out-of-state student, you know, at Maryland, which was going to be quite costly. And they said, we'll, we'll figure it out. And, and so I worked uh, in the morning at a gym right next to the Capitol where members of Congress would come work out the four votes. And in the evening after my internship, because it was an unpaid internship, I worked at Tortilla Coast, which was like a little Mexican restaurant right next Love to the Capitol as a server. And I just loved it. And I, I didn't want to play soccer anymore. And I, I saw the value of you know public service and happened to be there when September 11th happened. And, and that for me, I think clarified like what I wanted to do, which was to go into public service, give up the dream of playing like some, you know, third division level, you know, over in like an Eastern European country, you know, for yeah. like a hundred euros a week. Like I, I, I knew I wanted, you know, to do that. And it was a high school teacher that, you know, kind of showed me the way and I don't think I would have found it otherwise. Well, you two have That's lots right. in common on I the know. soccer front. I was going to say, goodness. I also played yeah. Division One soccer. We love yeah. that. Where'd you play? Maddie? But LMU, it's in LA. Yeah. 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 So. I have it. One of my, one of my aides went to LMU. Yeah. Yeah. You she's, know what uh, year? I think, so she, I, I believe was 2021. Oh, okay. She's actually, she's, she's, yeah, she's giving me the thumbs up. <laughs> oh, I graduated yeah. 2018. So if she was yeah. political science, maybe we walked by each other a few times, but. You were political science. Yes. Yeah. She's, she's our political aide. She worked in the official office, but now is 
on the campaign trail for me and, and staffs me for stuff like this. And wow, yeah. small world. You know, we uh, love LMU. Great view, like no view Alliance. better. Right? I don't know how you focus on soccer when you have like such a great view. You know, did yeah. you play all four years? Yeah. You did? Yep. Cool. Yeah. It was great. Good times. What Good times. Bay Area Club? What Bay Area Club did you play? Deanza Force. Yeah. I remember Deanza. Deanza was always. So did you do like the like the surf cup and wags yeah. and like yep. all those? Oh yeah. Turns? All of it. Yeah. It was it was it was intense. My dad was my coach. So yeah. It was what position? You know right? that? Attacking mid. Yeah. Center mid. Yeah. I, I was a goalkeeper. And I want like like every goalkeeper, I wanted to play on the field. And when it was made clear to me that I was not good enough to play in the field, I was like, okay, I'll show you. I'll be the goalkeeper. <laughs> like, I love oh. it. So I'm on the field in a position that most players don't want to do. So I just perfected as much as I could playing goalkeeper. So I was like still in the game. Yeah. Goalkeepers are very impressive. I always have thought that I'm like, I could never jump into the air as high as I can and like fall on my back. I just, I'm yeah. not, I'm not that girl. Absolutely not. But I literally, respect. I was late to like a what a little league soccer version game once. And because I was last, I had to beat the goalkeeper. Scariest <laughs> hour of my life. It's scary. I was like, this is, I saw death at my, at my eyes. Yeah. Five million times. I was like, this is, I will run anywhere. I'm not being in the goal. So kudos to you because that kudos. is terrifying. Yeah. We do have to talk about something else that is quite yeah. terrifying. And that is that the election is literally less than two weeks away. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. curious from your perspective, just pulse check, gut check, where do you think it's going to go? How do you feel about it? Like, what's the what's the energy level? You know, to, to go to a different sport, it's a jump ball right now. And it's, or if you want to be a little more grotesque, you know, it's a knife fight and 30 phone moves. It's about 30 races that are going to decide, you know, which direction the country goes. And it's going to be that close. And, and we're talking about an election night that's going to go late into the next morning, maybe even a couple of days later before we know the results. But frankly, Everyone was betting against us going into the midterms because the conventional wisdom has always been that the president's party in its first midterm election always mm-hmm. gets wiped out. And then that's for good reason, because history has shown that there's always like a overcorrection at the polls. But this is anything but conventional times, right? We had yeah. January 6th. We're coming out of the pandemic. We saw, you know, obviously... Mass shootings out of the pandemic are back. Uh, and even worse, you know, this Roe decision being overturned has reminded all of us that, you know, just as easily as rights can be expanded, they can be reduced and taken away. So it, it really is going to be that close. And in California, we've got four or five congressional races that are going to be decided by a thousand or so votes. I would also say any forecaster who thinks that it's going to be that easy for the Republicans to just sweep the House. I think this, the most vulnerable candidates lost on the Democratic side in 2020 and, and barely lost. We lost one seat by six votes in L.A. County. We lost another seat in New York by 46 votes. I'm sorry, a seat in Iowa by six votes, 300 votes in L.A. County and 46 votes in New York. So we lost vulnerable candidates then. The ones who have survived flipped a tough seat for us in 18, held it in 20 and are battle tested. And, and so I, I feel like we're going into this with battle tested candidates, you know, an issue of freedom that is motivating people across the country. And, and only, you know, the issue of the economy, which is a global issue, I think right. is the biggest challenge. And, and we just have to make the case that we are working in that problem and Republicans are just pandering to grievances. And, and so we're passing anti price gouging legislation. We're bringing down the cost, you know, of prescription drugs. We're trying to bring down the cost you know, of, of insulin for every family. So we're trying to work the problem. They're working for their own power. Jump ball. That's where we're at. Totally. Well, ball. we always say that one friend group can change the course of an mm-hmm. entire you know, election. One and those are whew, three cases for that as well. That's right. Well, thinking also about the messaging going on right now, you have been very much a part of this, including releasing an ad about abortion rights and abortion access in the U.S. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You know, as a former prosecutor, I thought about these abortion laws that are now being passed, you know, since the Dobbs decision. And you've seen many candidates call for expansion of, sorry, you can just come through. 
This is my wife trying no, to like, stay wait, out no. of shot. She's like crawling like a weirdo. Oh my god. That's she, so funny. Oh my god. She does I body my choice what shirt uh, on. I love you know, it. I'm doing the, the girl on the go podcast. Hi. Hi. <laughs> what is calling <laughs> um, so as a as a former prosecutor, I, I thought through like what is this gonna look like as as candidates are calling for locking up and charging women who make this decision with murder? Like what what will it look like as this plays out. And, and, and what it's going to look like is you're going to put police in this awful position. They're going to go knock on the door and a family that made this decision, which is a very personal family decision, they're going to find the mother hauled away. And, and I thought through, well, what, what would I do if my wife, if we made this decision, she made this decision, what would I do if a police officer told me that my wife is going to jail? Well, you know, I love the cops. I respect the police. I'm not going to let them take her. And, and in this ad, the guy steps in as any husband would. And then there's a confrontation with the police and the weapons are drawn and the kids are screaming. So we wanted to depict, you know, the horror yeah. of, you know, what this is going to look like. And, and even that the police aren't going to want to do this. And, and that's why we have the officer, because it's not an anti-police act. We have the officer looking at the family and saying, I'm just enforcing the law. And I think most of us want the police to enforce violent crimes in our community, not personal choice issues like abortion. And so we're running it now in, in two congressional districts, in addition to being, you know, placed digitally, it's it's running in Palm Springs in the Will Rollins race. That's a new seat that's been created. And also in Michigan for Congressman Dan Tildy, where he's running there. And it's, and it's not just for, you know, these candidates, it's for every, Demo- it, it really encourages people to vote Democrat, but that those are the two candidates running at the congressional. Yeah. And how has that message like that type of messaging resonated with people especially you know there's obviously people who are pro-choice and who will you know totally hop on board of that like how does that resonate with people is it is it a moderate issue like who is this for really so i'm just gonna give you the numbers right so just on twitter it has 3.7 million views and then you can like is is, you know when you guys run a podcast you look at the numbers 15 million impressions, you know, so people who have seen the ad. And then as we look at people who have shared it on Instagram, except so 42,000 retweets. So that's 42, you know, 42,000 people who shared this. And then it's the same on, on Instagram. When we look at it on Instagram, we find that it is widely shared. So Instagram, you see 5,000 people shared it on their story. 148,000 people watched it just on our Instagram. And then I, you know, just, I know, I know that the plural of anecdote is not data, but when you look at, you know, what people are saying when they share it, the, the common theme is vote. This is why we have to vote. This right. could happen. And then predictably we got, we received two responses from Republicans. One was like, oh, you guys are just overreaching. Great. Well, we play you know, we followed up and played all the statements from gubernatorial and Senate candidates saying they want women to be charged with murder. And then the other reaction was people saying, yeah, this is what we want to happen. And there's a a leading abortion rights activist on the pro-life side who said, this is exactly what I want to happen. And and I actually tweeted at her and I said, thank you for being honest, because so many Republicans, they just want to ignore this issue. They don't want to address it. And this is exactly what you want to happen. And I respect someone who will at least say, yeah, that's my views. Then most Republican candidates who have stripped from their website their views on abortion Mm -hmm. because they just want to deceive the voters. And then once they're elected, they're going to go in and put in place these policies. True. I mean, there's something we have two more. We have, by the way, teaser, we have two more ads coming uh, over the next uh, two weeks. And one of them, we've partnered with a couple artists on a a well-known song that'll be kind of the the Ooh. anthem close out you don't want to do a much. girl in the gov exclusive right now <laughs> and just <laughs> well i hope um, this song is on tiktok so that we can make it go viral yeah so okay i'll make we sure i'll make sure we get it to you and, and you'll be the first podcast that has deal 
Wow, deal. deal. Okay. Absolute Love deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do want to also talk about some of you know those threats, those things that Republicans have been saying, some of the things they've also been taking off their websites. Like, what is the true picture of what would happen if the Republicans even take back one of the two houses, you know, whether it's the House or the Senate? What does that look like? What are you expecting to see if that does happen? It, it would be chaos. Uh, it would be chaos for the economy. And, and it's interesting that the Republicans want to run on the economy. Well, as I said earlier, great. Like, well, I'll run on taking on price gouging, addressing the baby formula shortage, bringing down the cost of prescription drugs. Like, there's more to do, but like, we're actually putting up solutions, trying to get shit done. What Republicans would do is they would not fund the government. So you'd see a government shutdown. As the, the U.S. government spends more, just like every government in the world, you have to increase, you know, what your credit limit is, essentially. They would not pass a debt limit increase, which again, would just tank the markets and it would affect all of our you know, investments. If you have like a retirement plan, that would be seriously affected. On the issue of Ukraine, you would see, as Kevin McCarthy said last week, they're not going to fund you know, the Ukraine effort any longer. I was just in Kiev last week. I met with President Zelensky. I saw the terror on the ground of you know, air raid alerts as, you know, Innocent women and children had to, you know, duck for fear and go into bunkers as their loved ones fought for their lives over in the East. You know, this is a fight for freedom. And we would just walk away because the Republicans would not deliver the funding. And yes, they would try to put up on the issue of abortion, a federal abortion ban. Thankfully, we have the veto pen of Joe Biden right now. But if they were to win now and then get Donald Trump into the White House in 2024, that federal ban is coming. And, and I think one of the biggest challenges this election is to make sure that a woman and her male allies in a state like California or say a state like Nevada, where you have abortion protections and abortion rights, that you understand that your rights are almost as at risk as a woman in Arizona. Yeah. Texas and Georgia. And right now, a lot of my colleagues have told me, I was just on a group chat where we were talking about this this morning, that we believe we're seeing stronger turnout among women in states where the rights have already been taken away because you know they're rightfully pissed off, mm-hmm. vulnerable, threatened by this. But it seems like a distant threat to people in California yeah. and other places. And, and we need them to understand, you know, we can go backward pretty quickly. And so it's really on all of us. And again, not just women, male allies who are just as a part of this uh, as as the women are to turn out and vote because they could be gone. They could vanish like that. Totally. Yeah. I think that's a really, really important picture to paint, especially, yeah, like being in California, like, you know, the news still hurts, but it's obviously you can only be grateful that to live in a state like this. But yeah, at this point, like there is a lot to lose. But around this issue of you know, abortion access. Republicans have always been like, you know, this is a state's issue, but now here we are. Now they're implementing to make this a federal ban. What has it been like behind the scenes with some of these colleagues of yours who have this plan? Is this been a years in, like in the making situation? Like what have you heard on this issue for like kind of the past few years? Like, is this something that's been a priority for them kind of like secretly? Like what's oh, been oh, yeah, well- like? I wouldn't even say secretly, you know, they, they have made this a priority with, you know, the bills that they tried to force to get votes on, on the floor, you know, the heartbeat bill, which, you know, essentially says that at six to eight weeks that once you're at that point, you cannot have an abortion, no exceptions for rape, incest, health of the mother, nothing, but that's been something they've been trying to force a vote on for a long time. What I, what I think that was so telling about all of this is that once it passed or, or once the decision came out and, and states started to pass these laws, who is ultimately responsible for the Supreme Court? Well, it, it's Donald Trump, right? He was able to get three justices on the court in his first four years. Mitch McConnell denied us a justice in Obama's last year. But who has been the most quiet about that decision? Donald Trump, a man who would take credit for anything, like, Mm. you know, a good summer day, like he'll take credit for the weather, (laughs) right? A nice sunset. There's nothing, there's no limit to what this guy would take credit for. And he's been 
absolutely crickets on this issue. And in, in these rallies, it's not like he's like pressed for time. I mean, these rallies go on for like an hour and a half and he talks about the most ridiculous nonsense, but he has not said anything, not a peep from Donald Trump about, hey, I put those justices on the court. Isn't it great that there's an abortion ban in place? And mm-hmm. I think it's because he knows. He knows how unpopular this is. And he knows that this is a real threat to Republicans staying in the majority going into the midterms. And I, I think that should tell you something about how powerful of an issue you know this is for us. It's really? so well, mind-blowing. I think to just you know sort of wrap up here and give people maybe a little bit of hope, I hope, yeah. Yeah. in thinking about if the Dems win out big here, you know, they win the House, they win the Senate. Do you think there's a real possibility of putting through legislation that would protect reproductive rights? Like, is there is there a chance? Yeah, President Biden said last week that if we pick up two more Senate seats and hold the House, which is all doable, you know, there's, there's a path to do that. But the first piece of legislation he'll sign in 2023 uh, will be putting in place abortion rights so that never again the Supreme Court would be able to take this right away uh, from a woman. So, I mean, that is, that's got to be powerful, you know, motiv- a powerful motivator for all of us, you know, to see that happen. And, and I also look at, it's not just on abortion rights. It would be on, you know, what flows from that right. It's, it's the right to marry who you love. It's the right to contraception. It's the right, you know, to have two people from a different race marry each other. You know, they all, all of those rights come from the same Supreme Court reasoning that was thrown out in the Dobbs decision. And so we'll have to put all of that into law. But going back to your original question about, you know, it was states' rights. It's it's clear now that that was absolute bullshit, that Mm. this was really about control. Control yeah. over a woman, control over how a family comes to be, because you're seeing Republican lawmakers now also say that they want to go after in vitro fertilization, IVF. That one lawmaker recently said in the last week that 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 process is disgusting, and he would seek to ban that as well. And so it, it was never about states' rights. It wasn't even about you know being pro birth because. IVF is pro birth. It's just about control. It's about controlling how it happens, who it happens for. And that's why it's so important that we give the control to women and families and their doctor and not to Republican lawmakers. Yes. Yes, totally. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Is there anywhere that people can find you, see what you're up thank to? Thank you, guys. I, there's a lot of races out there to track. And, and you know, we're doing a lot of it through. My organization, it's called Remedy, and you can go to remedypack.com to learn about the candidates we're helping at Eric Swalwell, you know, on Insta and Twitter. But if I could just leave you with one race, please. and there's a lot of races to track, but there, there's one race in California. It's a new seat in the Palm Springs area and a 30 year Republican incumbent named Ken Calvert, who was voted against same sex marriage, who's voted against gays serving in the military who's voted against, you know, rights for gays at the work workplace. He is running in that district against, which has one of the highest concentrated LGBTQ populations in the whole world. Our candidate is Will Rollins. Will Rollins is a 38-year-old federal prosecutor from that district. He and his partner will be affected if these Republican policies go into place as far as, you know, same-sex marriage. And Will is running neck and neck. And it's one of the true toss-up seats in the country. We're taking a bus next weekend down, or this weekend down to Will's district of our Bay Area volunteers to knock on doors for Will. But Will Rollins, please look up that race. You can do there, you know, a small contribution, knocking on doors, sending text messages. That's going to be one of those, you know, knife fights in a small phone booth that I was talking about. Totally. Absolutely. Yes. Well, we will definitely get the word out there. And thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Go Dubs. Go Dubs. Go Dubs. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>